Good morning and welcome to our morning Bible study in Proverbs. Thanks for joining us today. Today we'll be looking at uh, gathering gold. Yahweh in Proverbs 10 uh, to 31. And we'll do our best to keep things running. We think we've figured out what caused the problems with uh, the YouTube and Facebook ta last time. And uh, hopefully everything will go smoothly. Thank you for your presence. And I'm looking forward to our study today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that uh, you have revealed yourself in your word to us, that it is profitable. And we pray that we would profit from our study today. Illumine us by your spirit. Grant us your wisdom as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm looking out the uh, window of my office, and it reminds me of the proverb that says, As snow in summer and as rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. It's not quite summer, but we've got snow <laughs> outside. The title, Today Gathering Gold. I, I chose that title because when I think about reflecting theologically on Proverbs, there's a variety of uh, methods of doing that. And the easiest method is looking at the verses that use Yahweh's name in the verse itself. It's kind of like walking along through a valley and finding gold nuggets just sitting right on the surface of the ground. And today I want to look at some of that gold in Proverbs 10 to 31. Uh, just a quick overview of the distribution of Yahweh in Proverbs. There's a total of 87 occurrences in the book. 68 of them, as you can see, are in Proverbs 10 to 31. So, and the bulk of those are actually in chapters 10 to 22. 55 of those 68. Uh, Yahweh occurs five times in the words of the wise, and none at all in the wrap-up sayings of the wise in chapter 24, six times in the Proverbs of Solomon that Hezekiah's men copied out, once in Agur's material, and once in the material in chapter 31. So, Yahweh occurs in all of the major sections of Proverbs, all of the major authors, the only minor section, the sayings of the wise, it's, is, uh, is the place where it's not explicit. Now, let me just remind you what we've said before, that Yahweh is the name that God revealed himself by to Moses. <clears throat> and let me just take a look with you at uh, Exodus chapter 6 and verses 1 through 8. And in this section, we have uh, Yahweh saying to Moses what he's going to do to Pharaoh. Okay? So we're just uh, after that, we're after the burning bush where he's revealed his name as I am that I am. And when, when you go to the people of Israel, you shall tell them that my name is Yahweh. This is the name I'll be remembered by. Uh, just in case uh, you don't remember seeing that. Uh, Moses there at the burning bush. And uh, right here in verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. You shall say, I am has sent me. But then in verse 16, go and gather the, Israel, the elders of Israel and say to them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has appeared to me. Notice in verse 15, this is my name forever. Now, 
in Exodus 6, 1 to 8, Moses gets a further description or um, yeah, description of Yahweh, what Yahweh means by or thinks about his name. Notice uh, in uh, this is after Moses has appeared to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh just kind of waves him off. Who is Yahweh that I should serve him? And Moses comes back and complains, Hey, I went and did what you said, and Pharaoh uh, made things harder, and now the people are ticked off at me. Well, here's what God says to Moses. I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name Yahweh I did not make myself known to them. Now, this does not mean that they didn't know the name Yahweh, but that Yahweh had not manifested his character, the character represented by that name Yahweh. And so he's going to fill out the details of what that name means. Specifically, in verse 4, I established my covenant with them to give them the land. I've heard their groaning. I have remembered my covenant. Okay, so notice the use of the word covenant. Then he says, say to them, I am Yahweh. So we've got, I am Yahweh again. Here's what I'm going to do. I will bring you out from the burdens. I will deliver you from the bondage. I will redeem you. I will take you for my people. I will be my God, uh, you, your God. And notice this, you shall know that I am Yahweh your God. That's verse 7. Then he says it again. I will bring you to the land which I swore, and I will give it to you for a possession for I am Yahweh. So three times in Exodus 3, 6, 1 to 8, Yahweh says, I am Yahweh. And he associates knowing that he is Yahweh with seeing him fulfill his promises. Uh, this text is uh, the key reason why I said that the name Yahweh means that God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping, or promise-making, promise-keeping God. And uh, Abraham received promises, but he didn't see the fulfillment. Same thing with Isaac and Jacob. They had received promises, but they hadn't seen the fulfillment. And it's when people see Yahweh fulfilling his word that they know that he is, in fact, Yahweh. That is the God who keeps his word. And that's what it means that by my name Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Of course, we know that uh, Abraham knew the name Yahweh from Genesis 12, 6 and other passages. But that's the significance. Abraham did not experience the significance of Yahweh as a promise keeper, promise fulfiller. So with that background, I want us to take a look at the instances of Yahweh in Proverbs 10 through 31. And what we're going to do is focus on uh, three aspects of Yahweh's self-revelation in Proverbs 10 to 31. And I can't cover all the material. And I think that if you would start studying all uh, 68 of these occurrences, you'll find that uh, you're gathering a lot of gold, you're gathering a lot of marvelous, heart-warming, faith-building, uh, sight-focusing truths. So, we're going to begin today with Yahweh delights and abominates. So, there are four verses in Proverbs 10 to 31 that explicitly use the language of Yahweh delights, or use the noun delight. In Proverbs 11.1, 1, we get that 
A false balance is an abomination to Yahweh, but a just weight is his delight. 1120, the perverse in heart are an abomination to Yahweh, but the blameless in their walk are his delight. 1222, those who deal faithfully are his delight, but lying lips are an abomination, and the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to Yahweh, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Now, let's, let's point out the obvious first. The word abomination serves as a contrast to the word delight. So, the first thing that we can learn is that if Yahweh delights in something, he doesn't abominate it. If he abominates it, he doesn't delight in it. And whatever it is that he says he abominates, we can infer that he delights in its opposite and vice versa. Whatever he says he delights in, we can, say, we can infer that he hates or abominates its opposite. You say, well, uh, what does this word delight mean? Well, uh, the word normally simply means to take pleasure in, to find uh, joy in. Uh, you look at the uses of delight throughout the Old Testament, you find fathers delighting in sons. Uh, you find the righteous delighting in doing righteousness. So the point is that Yahweh finds pleasure in what he delights in. Now, what is it that Yahweh delights in? Well, the first verse that we have here is that he delights in uh, a just weight. And you know, say, so what is a just weight? Well, a just weight, uh, the, the Hebrew word translated just here in Proverbs 11.1, is uh, the, the uh, standard word for a complete or whole weight. So uh, this word shows up in the Pentateuch and Deuteronomy and Leviticus to describe weights that if they are uh, marked as a ephah, or in modern language as a pound, or as a kilogram, that they actually weigh a pound or a kilogram. They're not 1.1 kilograms or 1.2 pounds or 0.8 pounds or 0.8 kilograms. They are, in fact, what they are stated to be. They're complete, no deficiency in it. Yahweh thus rejoices. We can start out here in... Yahweh finding joy or pleasure in business interactions that are accurate and honest. In contrast, it's the false balance that he hates. And false uh, deceptive is the word deceptive. I, I remember being uh, in China, I think it was the second day that I was there in 1989. Our family was going to be, my parents were going to be teaching at Beijing University in the English department. I was 18, my brother was 14, and we went out the guest, the, the west gate of Beida, that's the Chinese word for Beijing University, because there was a market out there and we wanted some food. And we were going to buy some oranges. And uh, their markets uh, are like any open air market that you would find in most of the world. Things aren't priced uh, and labeled like they would be in stores. You ask, how much do they cost? The guy tells you. And in this case, he pulled out a weight and uh, a, a, a stick that had a weight that moved along at one side and he had a basket here on the other side and he was weighing the oranges and then I 
I handed him a the equivalent of a $10 bill because he said that the, these oranges were $2.50. And uh, I'm Americanizing the money here. That's not what they call it in China. But uh, then he handed me back a $5 bill. So $2.50 for the oranges. And I give him a 10. He gives me five back. And I had learned just enough Chinese to know my number and money system. And so I said to him, I gave you 10. I want 750 back. And uh, as he had been handing me back my money, uh, all the other Chinese had gathered around and kind of were watching to see the foreigners be built and uh, taken advantage of. And when I spoke in Chinese and told him that uh, he owed me another $2.50, everybody burst into laughter and uh, the charade had been uh, exposed. Well, maybe that's funny for, for them, but Yahweh's perspective is dishonesty in business is an abomination. Now, I, I believe I just got a question that, uh, you know, that said, what is a good reference for meanings of Hebrew words in the Old Testament that one can purchase? Okay. Um, let me think on that. Uh, I'm assuming that the person is asking for uh, a non-Hebrew reader, and uh, I have a couple suggestions that I'll make here toward the end of uh, today's session. Keep that in mind. So, Yahweh delights in a just weight, but a false balance is his delight. That's the surface of this proverb. Let's take it just a step further before we move on. Can I ask you, do you, do you maintain a just balance in your mind when you are weighing other people? You know, I find that our fallenness inclines us to think the best of ourselves and less than the best of others. To cut ourselves slack easily and hold others to a more rigid standard. But that's unjust. Unjust either in not assuming the best about others, like we would want them to do for us, or in assuming the worst. This is what Jesus is getting at when he says in Matthew 7, Judge not. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. I can't spend much time here, but uh, when Jesus says judge not, he does not mean don't ever judge. Because in the very same chapter, he's going to call them to spot false prophets by their fruit to identify dogs to whom you should not cast what is holy and pigs, swine, to whom you should not cast pearls. So clearly, discerning the character of persons and by the nature of their actions is not what Jesus is prohibiting. Rather, what he's prohibiting is the very thing that Proverbs 11.1 1 is talking about, an unbalanced weight, using different weights for other people than we use ourselves. If we want people to be merciful to us, we should be merciful to them. Yahweh delights in a just weight. Now, moving on to Proverbs 11.22, what I want to highlight here is that what Yahweh delights in, in this case, are persons. That is, specifically, he's delighting in the blameless in their walk. So, we not only find Yahweh delighting in principles like justice, but we find Yahweh delighting in persons 
who manifest the character that he has. So the word translated blameless here is uh, the word, uh, what version of the Holy Scripture actually uses the name Yahweh in its rendering? Uh, there are two modern versions that use Yahweh. Uh, one is the Christian Standard Bible published by Hol Broadman and Holman. It is inconsistent in its use of Yahweh. Sometimes it uses all caps L-O-R-D. Other times it uses Yahweh. The only version that I know of that's consistent in its use of Yahweh is the Lexham English Bible, which is available th online and through Faith Life or Logos Bible software. Lexham, L-E-X-H-A-M. Uh, English Bible, abbreviation L-E-B. Proverbs 11.20, delighting in the blameless. The word blameless uh, is the word that describes a person who, uh, in my paraphrase, maintains a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. That is, they walk, Proverbs 19, 1, 1, 19, verse 1, uses this word Blessed are the undefiled, is the way the King James says it. Blessed are the blameless in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. They also keep his testimonies. They do no iniquity. So, these are. this is a person, the blameless is a person, whose life is characterized by obedience to Yahweh's word. And Yahweh delights in such a person. On the other hand... The perverse in heart are what he abominates. So, uh, this is another, another great example in Proverbs of how paying attention to parallelism can help us uh, think about this. Here we have walk and heart in contrast. So, we have inner character and outer behavior being contrasted, and that allows us, as we read this proverb, to see that the blameless in their walk are that because of the nature of their heart. Those who are not blameless in their walk are also that because of the character of their heart. And in this case, that character is described as a perversity, a twistedness. Or crookedness. Well, the questions are coming in hot and heavy. Uh, the question that came in today was just now was why not use I am instead of transliterating Yahweh? Well, uh, there's two reasons. Number one, uh, the Hebrew word I am is a yeah. It is not Yahweh. I am is not a translation of Yahweh. It's a translation of a different Hebrew word. Yahweh most likely means something like he is, although it may mean he causes to be uh, in terms of its uh, verbal derivation. So, uh, on the other hand, Yahweh... Um, is God's preferred name. It's the name he uses for himself throughout the Old Testament. He does not use I am uh, very often at all. So that's why I transliterate Yahweh and don't translate it Aya because it doesn't mean, I, beg, I don't translate it I am because it doesn't mean I am. Um, though, if you like that, Bruce Watke, in his Old Testament theology, took that approach. So, returning back to Proverbs 11.20, Yahweh, well, what have we seen so far? Well, we've seen that he delights in justice. We've seen that he delights in persons who are blameless. I think that means that we could come back around and say, well, Proverbs 11.1, 1, 
allows us to um, not only talk about justice as a concept, but talk about the just person. So the just person is a delight to Yahweh. The blameless in their walk, who are that because of their heart, are a delight to Yahweh. In Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to Yahweh, but those who deal faithfully are his delight. So Proverbs 12, 22, uh, just so you can see what I'm seeing when I come over here and take a look at the Hebrew. Uh, those who deal faithfully translated the ones doing faithfulness are his delight okay and what does this uh, what does this teach me about Yahweh well I think this is my third step so I have first looked at the surface I've second drawn inferences not only about behaviors but also about persons not only only about persons, but about their hearts. Now let me take a third step and say, well, if Yahweh delights in justice, Yahweh himself must be just. If Yahweh delights in those who are blameless, Yahweh himself must be blameless. If uh, Yahweh delights with those who deal faithfully, Yahweh himself must be faithful. Because what a person delights in is a reflection of their value system and thus of their character. So now I'm not merely seeing things that Yahweh does, like he, he delights in a just weight, but I'm now seeing what he is. He is just. He is blameless. And of course, there are places in Scripture that say this, so, uh, we're not inferring this without additional scriptural support. But I think this is the proper way to approach looking at what Yahweh reveals about himself in Proverbs. Last verse on this slide, I want to look at one of my favorites, actually that the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to Yahweh, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Oh. Now, have you ever looked up pictures of people when they're delighted? Isn't a smile, a look of, uh, of gladness, of joy, uh, one of the most common expressions of delight? So, if we've got this correct, then when I pray, I who am an upright person, that is one who in Proverbs 15, 8, who's living a straight life, the word upright basically means straight, somebody who walks in line with the guidelines that Yahweh has laid out. When I pray, Yahweh smiles. He's delighted. So, what am, I, what am I saying here? Well, I'm saying that this now uh, provides me a mental picture for God's expression when I come into the throne room of heaven. Revelation uh, 4, 5, and 6, we get descriptions of the throne room of heaven. We know that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. When you and I come into that throne room, the throne of grace, as the Hebrew writer describes it, where we can find grace to help in time of need, a throne of mercy, what expression is on the face of Yahweh? Well, this verse tells me that he is smiling when I come into his presence and so I can look up to my Heavenly Father and know that He's not frowning at me. He's not stoic. He's delighted. 
In fact, I imagine something like this. Oh, it's Phil again. So glad that you are coming back to talk to me. I delight in hearing from my children. Well, doesn't that make you want to talk to God? I mean, I find that if there, have you ever met a person who was just delighted any time you showed up and they were just enthused about talking to you? Well, that'd make you want to go back and talk to them. And that's what Proverbs 15, 8 is telling us, that Yahweh is delighted and enthused when we come into his presence. Now, I think that I can extend that exact same thinking to the previous verses, but let me note here that if Yahweh delights in the prayer of the upright, then Yahweh himself is upright. But, notice this, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. Now, let's just stop and think about that a moment. The sacrifice of the wicked. What is a sacrifice? Well, sacrifice is an act of worship. God required sacrifice in the Old Testament. There were morning and evening sacrifices. There were sacrifices for vows, sacrifices whenever you were thankful, sacrifices if you've committed sin. All sacrifices not associated with sin, just in case you weren't aware of that. It was a, it was a way to express gratitude or to have fellowship with Yahweh, and with the peace offering. And uh, so sacrifice was at the heart of fellowship with God within the context of uh, the tabernacle, temple, mosaic framework. But this verse tells us that if the character of the person is wicked, and uh, you know, just what does wicked mean? Well, uh, the word translated wicked uh, means f does not measure up to the, the standard of God's word. Wicked in English is an intense or very strong term. Wicked in Hebrew is a, a broader, less intense term that includes any deviation from Yahweh's standard. So righteous measure up to the standard. Wicked fail to measure up to the standard. These are the two opposites uh, that are sta uh, standard standard opposites in Hebrew. And a person who does not measure up to the standard of God's word and yet brings a sacrifice, this quintessential act of worship, Yahweh says, nope, that's an abomination. I reject it. Now, couple other observations here. Notice the paralleling of sacrifice and prayer. Okay, so sacrifice is paralleled with prayer. So that means that praying, if a person thinks that they're pleasing Yahweh by their giving, their praying, or their actions, their, their uh, religious actions, but they themselves are a person whose character is contrary to, deviating from Yahweh's word. He rejects that prayer. He rejects that sacrifice. He rejects that gift as though it's of some value. And of course, the prophet's Isaiah, in particular, skewers the hypocrisy of this people draws near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Yahweh says, away with your sacrifices. I don't want them. I don't need them. Not because he didn't require them, but because sacrifice, and let me 
drop this tidbit in here. Sacrifice was always a component of the walk with God, never the way to God. Yahweh redeemed Israel, saved them, brought them out of Egypt before he ever gave them uh, the covenant that showed them how to walk in relationship with Yahweh, a holy God. So, when this proverb talks about the sacrifice of the wicked being an abomination, it's not talking about a, a prayer for repentance. Clearly, Yahweh here is a prayer of repentance. If someone is turning from their wickedness to follow him, it's those who in the language of First John, say, I know him and do not keep his commandments. John says, they are liars and the truth is not in them. This proverb tells us Yahweh abominates such persons. You say, well, abomination is an awfully strong word. It is an awfully strong word. And I think it tells us how strongly Yahweh feels about Dishonesty, perversity of heart, lying, and even offering him worship when your heart is far from him. Well, I hope that just in these four verses, you're starting to see the kind of gold that can be mined by paying attention to the places where Yahweh occurs in Proverbs. In my next slide, that I'm not going to spend much time developing, but um, I want to notice that here we have four verses that have the word abomination in them, but they do not have the word delight. But since we've already learned from our previous uh, study that delight is the opposite of abomination. When we read these verses, we can use that information to help us learn what Yahweh delights in. So if the way of the wicked is an abomination, but he loves the one who pursues righteousness, well, in this case, loving the one who pursues righteousness, that's just in the same area as delighting. Pleasant words are pure. Here we get no description of what Yahweh does, but we can then infer that Yahweh delights in pleasant words. Uh, an abomination to Yahweh is everyone who is proud in heart. Well, what's the opposite of proud in heart? Humble of heart. So Yahweh delights in humility. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike, are an abomination to Yahweh. Okay, so then what does Yahweh delight in? Well, he delights in the one who justifies the righteous and the one who condemns the wicked. There's more but we're running out of time. I want to move on to uh, the last set of slides that I'm going to get to cover today, and that is Yahweh's sovereignty. A key feature of the verses in Proverbs that use the word Yahweh <clears throat> is a focus on the sovereignty of Yahweh. Uh, I didn't get to attend IHC this year, but I did hear parts of Jonathan Edwards' sermon on the sovereignty of God. Deeply appreciated what uh, Brother Edwards had to say there. And I like to say, borrowing this from one of my graduate professors, that the doctrine of God's sovereignty is the most comforting doctrine I know. Uh, sometimes the word sovereignty has been uh, associated in people's minds with a view of God as stern, frowning, and perhaps even a predestinarian, uh, sending some people to hell, choosing others for salvation only. Uh, but that, that need not be the case. That's not the picture that I find presented in Scripture. 
Instead, the sovereignty of God, in my mind, is associated with God as governor of the universe. And I picture God as sitting at his governor's desk, make it his throne, and there is nothing that happens in the universe that is outside the scope or the bounds of Yahweh's control. Nothing. And more particularly, nothing comes into the life of a believer that does not first if I can use my desk metaphor, cross the desk of Yahweh for his permission. There are no oopses or accidents, no unforeseen incidents. Yahweh is sovereign over every dimension of human life, even down to, as um, Proverbs 16.33 says, the lot is cast into the lap but its every decision is from Yahweh. We tend to think about casting lots. You know, lots would be, uh, uh, in, in normal form, would be two items, whether it was stone or wood or paper, <clears throat> that had the words yes or no on them or names on them, and they are then placed in a container so the person drawing can't see, the person they're shaken up, the person reaches in, draws them out. And this verse says Yahweh is in control of what in our 21st century we tend to call chance, uh, random occurrences. But Proverbs asserts, no, when you are drawing lots, that is seeking to discern the will of Yahweh via this method, I don't have time to answer the question, uh, should we do that now or not? But let me point out that that was how the disciples determined who Yahweh wanted as the replacement disciple for Judas. Um, that's a, a larger discussion than we have time for on this discussion. But the sovereignty of God encompasses every event in the universe. He either, there's, a, there's only two kinds of events, events that he plans or events that he permits. Events that he plans or events that he permits. And we see Yahweh's sovereignty over our plans. Uh, commit your works to Yahweh, your plans will be established. He's sovereign over the destiny of the wicked. He is sovereignty over the relationships that we have. So when our ways are pleasing to him, he can make even our enemies to be at peace with us. Well, I love that verse. I say, Lord, help me to live in a way that's pleasing to you because I want my enemies at peace with me. Um, the mind of man plans his way, but Yahweh directs his steps and... Uh, let's see, didn't want that. Let's see if I can get rid of that. There we go. And, oh, it's being wonky on me. All right, here we go. This verse, a man's steps are from Yahweh. As for man, how can he understand his way? Ultimately, the course of your life and my life is not determined by our decisions, but by Yahweh's sovereign action. Does Yahweh make room for grace-enabled human will? Absolutely, he does. Does he always leave our will free to choose whatever we want? No, he certainly does not. Um, the mind of man may seek to withstand Yahweh, but there's no counsel against him. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to Yahweh. Well, we're running out of time, and uh, I'm sorry that we don't have time for more discussions. Uh, the last question that I got was, would the sacrifice of Cain meet this definition in Proverbs 15.8? Yes, the sacrifice of Cain would. We know from Hebrews 11 
that Abel offered his sacrifice by faith and that faith is believing what God says. Since Abel offered it by faith, God must have told Cain and Abel the kind of sacrifice that he wanted. Cain disobeyed, that is wickedness. Wickedness, deviation from God's standard, and thus his sacrifice would have been an abomination. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry that we ran out of time. I, I have a set of slides here on Yahweh's omniscience. That's a key component of understanding the fear of Yahweh. But I hope our discussion today has alerted you to the riches to be mined from Proverbs and just paying attention to those places where Yahweh's name is mentioned in the book. I want to conclude by coming back to that uh, first uh, set of verses that we looked at and modeling for you a response to Yahweh. Remember, we don't study the Bible merely to know about God, but to know Him in personal relationship. And personal relationship requires dialogue and communication. So with Proverbs 11.1, 1, I say, Thank you, Yahweh, that you delight in me when I use a just weight. Help me to weigh others the way I would want to be weighed. And ultimately to remember that you are the one who are weighing me. Uh, therefore, I want to uh, walk humbly in your sight. Thank you, Yahweh, that you delight in the blameless. Sometimes being blameless is a challenge, is difficult. It certainly runs contrary to the culture and at times contrary even to my inclination. But the fact that your smile is upon me as I choose to do what is right in your sight, keep a conscience void of offense towards you and toward others, encourages me and heartens me in that walk. Thank you that you smile as I'm talking to you. Help me to keep in mind that you delight to be in the presence of your people, that just as you came to walk and talk with Adam and Eve, so you have come to live within me, live within us as your people, so that our fellowship can be unbroken. May today be a day of continuous lifting of my heart to you, knowing that the face that looks at me, your face, is a smiling face, one delighting in the upright. And to that I say, Amen. It's been great to be with you. I trust you have a good day.